Jesus' name. Father Lord, we thank you once again. We exalt your name. We thank you for such a wonderful evening as this. This is the night we use the opportunity to exalt the name of the Lord, to honor the God who laid the foundation of the heaven and who set his being upon the water. The God whose dominion is from everlasting to everlasting, whose kingdom will never end, and his will will never pass away. To him, glory, honor, dominion, strength, much wisdom forever and ever. O oh Lord, we thank you because of who you are. The hour has come once again to exalt your name, to thank you and to lift you above the heaven. Lord, we thank you for your brethren that will be able to participate in this event. Even for as many, O oh Lord, who may not be able to participate, we say, Lord, let your name be exalted. Lord, we thank you on behalf of our family and behalf of the people of God. Even those, O oh Lord, who have said in their heart, there is no delight in God. There is no strength in the mighty God because of their affliction or because of the pain they have faced. Lord, will you this video to say, let your name be exalted in your heart. For as many that will come to this program say, and decree your healing, as many that will come with one burden of your heart or of your other, Lord, you will meet them at the very point of your name. Because your word says the expectation of the righteous will not be cut off. Lord, the expectation of your children tonight will never be cut off in Jesus' name. Amen. Brethren, we are welcome again this night. This is the night we use the opportunity to share with you the word of God. To exalt the name of the King of Heaven. This is our Open Heart Fellowship. This is CGF Open Heart Fellowship. It's a non-denominational fellowship where we use the opportunity to teach the word of God to anybody that wishes to listen. This is a program where all Christians are free to participate, especially those who have interest in mission. And this, today's teaching is something that may be essential to you and to your church and may help you to build your fellowship into a standard. And for many brethren who are interested in having fellowship with us or joining Open House Fellowship, you can go to our website and register on cgfnslogin.app. The link is up beneath the video. You can also use this opportunity to visit most of our past program. If you have missed anything, you can learn. The, the, this program is designed that in six months to make you a potential missionary. It covers all fields of mission training from evangelism down to leadership. So this period, this is our fourth week on the study of church growth. And after this week, by next week, we'll be starting another topic on Christian leadership. So we expect to see you as you join this course. Today, I will be your host. My name is Missionary Collins. God bless you as you participate. Brethren, before we start, I will want to remind you, today we are looking at a topic known as cell church. Cell church. What is a cell church? Why would God want believers to operate a cell church? Was cell church ever known in Christian history? Was it a part of the Bible teaching that Christ himself placed before us? Yes. We will take our test from the book of Corinthians, from the book of Acts of Apostles, from verse 10, chapter 10, verse 22 to 48. Acts chapter 10, verse 22 to 48. That is where the test and this whole teaching will be taking place from. Because of time, I will not spend time reading the entire chapter. We will read the chapter as we go. So, our point of note for today is they broke bread in their homes and ate together with gladness and sincere hearts or singleness of hearts, praising God and enjoying favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were saved. And that is the focus of our teaching today. Breaking of bread from house to house, praising God, having all things in common, praising God with singleness and sincerity of heart. And that is what 
That is the summary of what self-fellowship is all about. When we talk about self-fellowship, like the CDF Open House, we encourage self-fellowship among veterans. We do not operate a church or a standard church. We are, we are non-denominational ministry, so we do not operate any church. But we encourage self-fellowship because we use it as an opportunity to teach missionary in their respective zone so that they also, in turn, will be able to teach other. Because remember what the Lord Jesus told us. He said, the things you have heard and received, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So we believe that you today, listening to the sound of my voice, you are that faithful man or faithful woman, which God has instituted to be able to teach others. Our first reading, we will read 1 Corinthians chapter, Act of Apostle chapter 2, from verse 46 and 47. Acts 2, 46 and 47. Acts 2, 46 and 47. And the day after, and day after day, they regularly assemble in the temple with united purpose. And in their home, they broke bread, including the Lord's Supper. They partook of their food with gladness and simplicity and generosity of hearts. Constantly praising God and being in favor, being in favor and goodwill with all the people. And the Lord kept adding to their number daily those who were saved. Save from what? Save from spiritual death. The Lord keep adding to the number of the church those who were saved from spiritual death. Because why? They break bread from house to house. Today, brethren, the purpose of communion, when we hear about Holy Communion, is to be able to break bread from house to house. There is no a single script in the scripture where Christ gathered the entire temple together and said today is our Holy Communion. No. The supper always takes place in a house. So the communion of the Lord is to show the Lord death until he come. And when we show the Lord death, we do it among bedroom, among close bedroom. That is our cell unit. That is the purpose of bread breaking in the church or holy communion. It's not a ceremony. It's a synonym of Christ's death burial and resurrection because his body was broken for us brethren today our teaching is focused on a specific place in the Bible the church did not have any building until it became the official church in the Roman Empire under the reign of Constantine in 321 AD then it took over all the pagan temple and priestly rule and had, had them ever since. And that is what happened in Pergamon. When the church married the world. And that is all the congregational building and the temple stand for. The church got wedded to the people of the world. So the pagan worship, they took it over. The idol temple become congregational church. And the priests, idol priests became preachers and prophets in the house of God. And most of the doctrine and the, the clothes you see in the church, you see bishop with small cap in the front of the head. Where did you see it in the scripture? I can show you the ancient Hebrew dress. Such was never part of it. Because they got all those things from the robe, purple robe. It's a splendor of the woman, the harlot, the robe the ancient Roman Empire. So, this is where the church, I'm not condemning Congregational Church, God knew that I also attend, and I knew fully well that, but the church history must be told. Remember what the Lord Jesus told us, that I said, if the foundation being destroyed, there is nothing the righteous can do. So as a Christian, we must be sure that the foundation we're building, we are building it upon God. It doesn't matter where you worship or whether your church is a congregational church or not. 
But what matter is, are you carrying out the activity that Christ instituted in the scripture? Or do you hide some truths away from your member? That is what matters to God. Now let's go to the scriptures. What did the apostle did? And what was their method of worship after Christ's death? Remember Christ said to Peter, Upon this rock, I will build my church. So many Christians argue that Peter was the rock because he called his name Cephas. No. Peter was not that rock. But the faith that he possessed. Because many of us, he asked the entire disciple the same question he asked Peter. He said, Whom does the people say that I, the Son of God, I am? They said, Some say you are Moses. Others said you are John the Baptist. Some say you are one of the prophets. Then, he now asked them, Who do you say that I am? Peter looked up to him and said, Thou art Christ. The Son of God who should come. Peter knew who he was. And Jesus looked and said, Fresh and blood has not revealed this to you. But the Spirit of my Father. And that because you have confidence in God. And because of your faith upon that truth and that foundational faith, I will build my church. And the gate of hell will not prevail against it. The gate of hell will not prevail against this church. But today we wonder, the Lord said the gate of hell will not prevail against the church. And the Bible says to us, by two immutable things, it is impossible for God himself to lie. Then, what do we see? Satan really supreme among congregational churches. And those that call upon the name of the Lord, they take his name in vain. And people practice sin openly in the church and they go unpunished. That's because the doctrine was not followed. The church of Christ was founded on unity. It was born in a mystery. The mystery of the Holy Spirit being embodied in the body of a believer. And that church which was founded in a mystery the Lord also make it clear to us in Thessalonica that it shall be concluded in a mystery by the rapture of the saints. This church was founded by the mystery of God and it ended by the snatching away of the Christian from the earth by the Holy Spirit. So, now we understand that the church of God was built upon mystery. And the mystery of faith, the mystery of the Holy Spirit, which was spoken by Joy the prophet, that on the last day I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dream, and your young men will see vision. And upon all flesh will I pour out my spirit. This is what the prophets speak about. The Holy Spirit be given to every believer. But remember, the Holy Spirit did not come in the apostle time because they were divided, or because they were fighting each other, or because they were bastarded, or because the deacon has grown so much that he now wants to become a founder of a church. No. The Holy Spirit was given for one reason and one reason, O Lord. Alone. They were all united. They break bread from house to house. They have all things in common. And they were united with one voice. They rectified the foundation of Judah is carrot that was faulty. And they root away sin from their midst. And the church gathered together in a simple form of unity. And they cry unto the Lord with one accord. And the Bible said, How peaceful is it from them to dwell together in unity? It's like the oil poured into the head of Aaron that ran down towards his beard, down to the skirt of his garment. It's like the dew of the Lord upon my hammer, even where God combined his blessing. 
evil life forevermore. The blessing of the Lord cannot be commanded outside of unity. For the church to overcome and for the gate of hell not to prevail against the church. We must stop naming church after John, Peter, Paul, and James. We must understand that the church of God has no name. And that the church of God, though we be many, we are one. Whatever religion format you choose to take in your church, the church of God is one. If the leg is sick, the whole body is sick with it. And if the head is sick, the whole body is sick with it. Only on that ground can the church of God fully actualize their purpose, which, for which purpose Christ set it up. That upon the church, I will build my church, but the gate of hell will not prevail against it. Then, what is the church there for? The church has a building. It has no building when it started. They operate in believer homes. They operate in small caves, in dens in the mountains, because of the fear of the Roman Empire, who was vicious in the persecution of the church under Drupisha. And then, the church officially, under the Roman Empire, in 321 AD, I will not say they became, the Roman became Christian. The Roman became Christianized. They beat their idol temple into church. And I would call that religious. The Roman became religious, non Christian. Christians and religious are two separate things entirely. Religion is a crack, makes people live, pretend to live a good life. Why Christianity show forth conduct? That's why in ministry, of the missionaries. We don't separate between religions of who is a Christian, Muslim, Buddha, or atheist. Those are traditions. But what we want to know, we separate the world into two forms. One is the saved, the other one is your saved. Those who are heavenly born, or twice born, or those who are born once after the flesh. That is the only separation you can make of all human race. Not 20 religions. We don't have two religions, we have only two. We don't have 100. Those who are for God and those who are for the devil. You cannot be in between. There is no neutral person on earth. You are either for God or you are for the devil. Or you will be deceiving yourself. And that's why in the Sad Fellowship, we focus on this teaching. Because this is where the apostles started and how they use it to be able to send spread churches around the entire Asia Minor, which is today Turkey, and down to Israel, down to the part of the Samaria, and down to Ethiopia in Africa, and down as far as India, under the ministry of faith who eventually was killed there. These cell structures, the apostle practices, and it worked for them. And I believe the church can do better to return to the cell structure. It helps us to be able to build up converts. Because let's take a clue. If you have a church of about 200 people, and a member had just committed immorality, and you're looking for a brother to talk with, can he come before 200 club and expose himself? I don't think so. But if they are about 10 or 12, he can say, brother, I have fallen in the faith. I need prayer. And they will come together and restore him back to faith. It breeds Christians. Why congregationalism breeds chaos? I mean, for example, the head of a church in a self-fellowship discovered that he has lost the glory his life is no longer worth it. He can easily come before 12 or 6 and make up the sound for his sins. And they all together will pray for him. And he will be restored back to the faith. But if there are 20,000 and it's a global church, I bet you he cannot come on television to tell his member that I was 
involved in extramarital affair. Now he needs confession. It takes extraordinary grace for him to fall from that heart. And that is why Christ says to you that for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, it shall be easier for head of a cabin to pass through the eyes of a needle. It's not that they cannot be saved. It's because their pride will not allow them. And that's why as a Christian, you have to calm down and understand that you are safe, much more safer in yourself than in the open congregation. He took over the pagan's temple. That was the first thing the church did. They thought it was a glorious thing. The Lord has defeated devil. Now we head it devil house. After all, the Lord says, the earth is the Lord, and the fullness thereof. The world and everything that lives therein are theirs. But you forgot when God said to the children of Israel, when you get to the land of Canaan, make sure you lay waste to all their idols and destroy their houses. Do not dwell in it. Why? Because their idol will become a snare to you. But the church, instead of destroying Roman and pagan temple, they built their new church on top of the idol temple. And they took off their priestly robe and wore them. And they forgot what happened to Achan. When he went to, in, in the battle of Jericho and he fought some pretty fine rock and carpets and he took them to his heart and hid them in his tent. You know what God did to him? He was thrown to death in the valley of Archer and the heap stone upon him. But the church has forgotten all this. The church took up princely garments and indirectly knowing to them what they could not, the devil could not accomplish in manner by persecuting the church and laying waste the Christian life, they accomplish in Pagamos by getting married to the world. And Satan was able to successfully marry the church to the world. That's why today we have Christian politicians. We have Christian idol worshippers. We have Christians who are more greedy for money than bankers. So today, what kind of Christian are you? Are you still that bride that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming for? That has no stain or any such spot or wrinkle? Or you have become so stained with the world that you cannot be differentiated between Christians and unbelievers? Between those who are saved and those who are not? Between light and darkness? When darkness and light look alike, there must be, the total light must be darkness. Darkness and light is not meant to look alike. They are meant to be different. Beauty and glory, they shine alike. But dirtiness and wretchedness cannot be compared to beauty. Christianity is a place where people who were once dirty are purified made white, that they may be fit to meet with their Lord at his precious return, to take him, to take home his bride. But what happened? If the Lord come, shall he indeed find faith in the earth? Shall he find that the bride he has left behind has turned idol temple into his house, or put on priestly robe like an idol priest? Christ was on earth. Maybe you read it that he wore Prince Pro gown. Christ, when he was on earth, he was the son of a capital. And he ministered as the son of a capital. He teaches as the son of a capital. And his followers were not the kings and the mighty rich men and the Pharisees. His followers were fishermen, sinner, tax collector, and those. Who, a set mighty, who was a physician that ministered to the poor. But what are your members make up of? Politicians? Who you are not perhaps telling them the truth because the money may stop coming? And they stole from the poor and they give it to you so that you can make yourself rich? What shall we profit a man? If this whole world is your game and you lost your soul at the end, what ransom can you give the Lord for your life? 
Can you buy your soul from death? And had them ever since then, the church has not pulled it off. In Acts chapter 2 verse 46, tell us that any church met together every day in a Jewish temple. Not in some structure they call Hagia Sophia in Turkey, but in Jewish temple in Jerusalem to worship God. And they also break bread in homes. And they ate together with gladness of heart, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. Amen. How did they manage to do this? They enjoyed the favor of the people because of their conduct. There is the song, the songwriter says, Let people see Jesus in you while you are going through this world of sin. Your life is a book before the people's eyes. They are reading you through and through. And they ask themselves a question anytime they read you. Does your life point them to the sky? Or does it point them to the grave? Today, does people see, see Jesus in you? You may be a minister. You may have all the titles and all the bishop rights. But did people see Jesus in you? When you go through your streets, does a villager looking at you from a distance say this is a Christian? We don't believe and look at you without you preaching and repent and give his life to Christ. Or we they say this is a man. He does not deserve to be a Christian. The church was in the streets with the people, not yet hidden away inside a religious building. But today, the people don't know the difference between church and party house. Sunday was in Africa. Every Sunday, you don't see anybody in the street. They are all in one church or the other. But on Monday morning, the same man you see in the church will not realize who he is in the streets. But when you want to preach to him, you say, I'm a Christian. I go to church. <laughs> I go to church. You are not a Christian because you go to church. You are a Christian because you behave like Christ. Said church do so well. The said church usually have up to 5 to 15 people. So as a result, there is energy shared. Anointing can be transferred. Powers can be shared. This means that everyone is known and genuinely means in their absence. When you look around it, 5 people or 15 people in your step group, you will notice somebody is missing. Somebody was not in the church today. So let's take the church away and take it to his heart and hold the fellowship there. But can you move a church of 20,000 to a person's house? Or you can move a church of 5 or 15 people to the person's house. If he's sick, you fellowship with him and you pray and heal him or her. Do you think you will ever miss any member? No. No member will be lost because the care will be eminent. No wonder when Peter was thrown in prison and went to execution for error, the church could come together and intercede. And they could pray until God sent his angels and deliver Peter from prison. But what if the church were 20,000? They would not even notice the absence of Peter. At least there is an assistant pastor to take over. This means that everyone is known and genuinely missed if they are away. And the church means that every member has a role in music, organizing, teaching, leading, cooking, looking after children. The joy is the joy of serving is not just in the hands of a few choosing professional or clergy leaders. No. Everybody serves and nobody is a leader except Christ. That is how the church of God should be. Because the Bible says, if any one of you want to be the head in the kingdom of heaven, let him be the least of you all. For you to be the head in God's kingdom, be the least in the church. The church means that people never feel lonely in the church. 
as the community setting, bring them into the bosom of the family of God. The church is a natural setting of teachings with all the freedom. It's not when you fill stadium, a life of a small group. Set church meetings are a great place for people to practice their spiritual gifts in a non trick threatening atmosphere of hope with a friendly leader and a Christian family to encourage one another and to help. Self church means that neighbor who would never go to into a church building might discover Jesus where he loved to be. Among people with said church, the scope a different kind of creative evangelism in the home is not limited. The said church allows the gifted ministers to travel to help equip other believers. In said church, grow in fast and never limited by track of money for building. They grow, grow beyond saying 16. It multiplies into two homes of rented house, each with its own leader, and they will soon grow to 15. And multiply again. The cell church means more prayer because more people will pray in small group and they can meet anytime. It is better than weekly prayer. In one place, which many never get to walk reasons. Sales church means the sick or needy people can pray for quickly without having to wait for pastor or fill a special form for invitation or visitor form. Cell and congregation celebration. A cell church has no central church that is owned or paid for or a big meeting every Sunday because the cells are the church. No central records are kept. So in persecution, names cannot be formed. Building cannot be bought. Congregation cannot be formed and killed in mass as it happened in Rwanda and many other places in Nigeria. The church is safer. And all the selves, leaders, and people alike should come together from time to time in a rented location with a big hall or a stadium for a celebration. And all the selves in a zone should meet as a congregation, say once or maybe twice a month. The oversight need to meet with their cell leader on a regular basis. The oversight should visit each cell regularly. This is what we call cell church. And this was how the apostles were able to grow from 12, that Jesus, 12 apostles of Jesus Christ, to 3,000 the days of Pentecost, to about 5,000 people in the early church, and beyond that spread around the entire world. What do you do in a cell church? The goal is to be a friend of God through Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Let's read. Acts 2, 42. It said, And they steadfastly preserve, devote themselves constantly to the instruction and the fellowship of the apostles, to breaking bread including the Lord's Supper and prayer. As a sense of aware, reverential fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were multiplied through the apostle. So this is what happens when you have a set church. Model of being devoted in the word of God, prayer, breaking bread and fellowship, then friends of each other. Then focus on being friends with people in the streets, 
So they discover that God's love is not a million miles away. Remember the four embrace. One. Welcome. You welcome you to me and me to you. To every believers in your self fellowship. Two, worship us to God. Timmy, what God released to us through the Bible, spiritual gift, prayer, and personal ministry to each other. Witness God through us to others. That's how he said this build. So, a self church like we already run in CGL, and if you're also interested, you can write us. We can show you how to start one. Starting a self church is very easy for missionaries to organize a self church simply having the first meeting in a home. Growing in self, it is more difficult to change an existing traditional church structure because self church empower the people to care and evangelize and this can be quite upsetting for professional paid ministers. The change can be quite demanding upon settle and uncomfortable people as well. But if God directs the change, it will be worth the effort. How to change to a self church? There needs to be adequate led in prayer, plan and agreement. Choose all the leaders and assistants for humility, servant hearts, loyalty. Train them beforehand in pastoral skill. How to run a small group. They need to know the extent of their authority and what to do in difficult and divided districts. Divide districts into zones and each one with dedicated area leader. Divide each zone into cells, each with a choosing leader and people. Select a time to meet and start, make a start. Review progress frequently. This is what you can easily do. But brethren, let's go to the scripture. So we know that our teaching is founded in the scripture. In Acts chapter 10, Acts of Apostle chapter 10. I will read from verse 22. What does it say? And they said, Cornelius is centurious. Cornelius was a centurious. Captain, what will we call it today? Captain in the army. Who is said and upright? Who is a just and upright and in right standing with God? Being God fearing and obedient and well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation. That means by the New Testament quality, he qualified not just to be a preacher, but he qualified to be a bishop over a church. Being God fearing and obedient and well spoken of by the whole people of the Jewish nation, and has been instructed by the holy angels to stand, to send for you to come to his house, and he has received in answer, warning, a warning to listen to and act upon what you have to say. Peter invited them in to be his guests for the night. The next day he rose and went away with them. And some of the brethren from Joba accompanied him. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was waiting for and expecting them. He had invited together his relative and his intimate friend. Peter, as Peter arrived, Cornelius met with him, 
Falling down at his feet, he made up slurs and paid worship reference to him. But Peter raised him up, saying, Get up, I myself am also a man. And as Peter spoke with him, he entered the house and found a large group of persons assembled. And then he said to them, You yourself are aware of how it is not lawful or permissible for a Jew to company with or to meet or to visit, even to come near or to speak first to any anyone other of another nationality. But God showed. God has shown and taught me by word that I should not call any man, any human being, common or unholy or ceremonially unclean. Wherefore, I was sent for, and I came without hesitation or objection or misgiving. So now I ask, for what reason you sent for me? Cornelius said, this is how the fourth day since about this time, I was observing the ninth hour at three o'clock in the afternoon of prayer in my lodging place. Suddenly, a man stood before me in dazzling a prayer, and he said, Colinius, your prayer has been heard and happened to, and your donation to the poor have shown, has been known and observed before God, so that he heed and is about to help you. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simeon, who is summoned, so named Peter, and he is staying in the house of Simeon, the tunnel of the seaside, by the seaside. So at once I sent for you, and you being a Jew, have done a kind and courteous and handsome thing in coming. Now then, we are all present in the sight of God to listen to listing that you have been instructed by the Lord to say. And in verse 4, Peter opened his mouth and said, Most certainly, thoroughly, I now perceive and understand that God showed no partiality, no respect of persons is with him. But then before we continue, I want to take a deep reflection here. Peter, a Jew, he cannot company with unbeliever. He cannot company with somebody that is ceremonial and clean. Because Columbus was ceremoniously unclean to the judge. The Jews does not partner with Gentile. Just as the Bible told us as Christians not to be equally joke with unbeliever. But the Lord said to Peter, the hour has come for you to go. Go and meet Cornelius. He's a devoted man. Because whatever I make it clean, do not call it unclean. So some Christians are hesitant. If I go to preach to that hall of people see me within, they may think I have something. The Lord is saying to you today, if you are ashamed to present me before men, I will also be ashamed to present you before God. Remember, Mary, the sister of Lazarus. Who was she? She was the same woman whom the Pharisees, when they cited, they said, if Jesus has known what manner of woman is this, he will not even allow her to touch him. But what did Jesus say to them? He that is clean does not need a physician. If every Sunday all you do is minister to Christian, witness to Christian, prophesy to Christian, you are not doing anything in the Great Commission. Your talent ends in the church. Oh, you are filled with the Holy Spirit for Christian. You prophesy for Christian. Your healing is for Christian. Your demise is for Christian. Your offering is for Christian. Your tax is for Christian. Is that what Christ came to do? Did Christ came to die for Christian? 
Did he not come to die for sin also? Christ teaches us that you that must come to me, you must first deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. Colinus was a captain in the army. He was a centurion. That means he had hundred soldiers under his control. Most of us don't even have one slave under our control. But this man had hundred soldiers under his control. He can say to them, attack, they will attack. Stand fast, they will stand fast. But when he wrote this angel said to him, go to Peter, send for Peter. When Peter came, he made oblations to Peter. Who was Peter? We know where he came from. Peter was a fisherman. He was not a counselor. He was not a senator. He was not a bishop. He was not a pope. You know who he was? A fisherman. The captain make all the sons to Peter. Peter has to raise him up from the floor and say, I'm just a man. I'm not God. The Bible says, if you seek him, you will find him. The man sought Christ and indeed he found Christ. He stretched out his hand to God and God came to him. God did not say to Peter, invite him to the church. Tell him that I don't minister home service. That I am a bishop Peter, the head of all the Pentecostal church, whom the Lord Jesus gave the mantle to. And know so therefore since Jesus Christ has given me the mantle, I have grown so big that I cannot come to your house. Please, tell your servant that the man should come and see me in Doha, that I am lodged at my hotel resort beside the sea. I think that would be a very good message. That moreover, I am a Jew. Jews have no dealing with Samaritan. But Peter rose up at once, without hesitation, and he went straight to the house. On getting there, he met a crowd of people. Self fellowship has completed. And the Bible said, before he opened his mouth to speak, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter saw that they were filled with the same Holy Spirit. He was filled. He said, What he this wants to be baptized. And he took them to the water and baptized them all. Why am I saying this? Fellowship brings conviction. It brings friendship. People will not speak to a stranger, no matter how holy you are, but they will speak to their friends. Hidden things cannot be confessed to you in an open congregation, but it can be talked to you about in their private home. If the people cannot come to church, take the church to their home. If the people cannot be in your fellowship, hold the fellowship in every member's house. And I get you, I bet you they will participate in the fellowship is being held in their house. If you want to save a stubborn man, take the gospel to his house. Sit in his parlor, gather his children around and his wife. Let him put cotton wood in his ear. He will still hear some of the word. The word of God is stronger than any two of the sword. You cannot force people to be saved. But the word is too sharp a sword that it can pierce the most stubborn heart. You can drag the word of God into bones and marrow. Pierce the heart with the sharpest dagger and convince the Gezea. So this world is full of power and it can convince the most potent heart. Christians need to understand that God did not die for only Christians. He died for the hallows too. He died for the idol robbers. And he died for those who are in prison right now. He died for those in the hospital in critical care. 
who their life counts on the speedometer. The Lord Jesus died for them all. He died for the demonic process who has wasted a thousand souls out of ignorance. And one mistake Christians always make. They think the devil has friends. No. Nobody is his friend. Not you, not me. Not anybody. The devil only has an enemy. Even though, what about those that work for him? Even those that work for him. You want to know if you are his friend or not? Fail one mission. Let him send you on an error and you does not deliver. You will know whether he is your friend or your enemy that day. Or let him send you to Lagos. You say, I'm going to Kaduna. He is not God. He's not going to carry a fish to, to swallow you up and vomit you up in fashions. The fish will swallow you up and you go into his bed. That's what he's going to do to you. He does not have a friend. In fact, no man born of a woman is his friend. They are all his enemy. Because God has commanded him to bruise their heels while they bruise his head. He said, I will kill you or you kill him. Remember what the Bible says, do not despise a thief when he comes to steal to satisfy his heart. And we know who the devil is. He is a thief and the father of thief. He has not knowledge the truth. When he speaks a lie, he speaks about himself. Because he is a liar and the father of it. No bitch. That when the thief steals to kill, to, to satisfy his heart, what happens if the thief is caught? He will restore sevenfold. Do you think the devil does not know what will happen if he is caught? He will restore everything he stole. So because he knew that, he don't want to ever get caught. And when you get caught, you are on your own. Because he's not going to stand in for his agent and say, my agent was not successful. It is not his fault. I will show mercy. Mercy does not exist in hell. Forgiveness to the devil is a sin. He doesn't believe in anyone. Neither will he ever forgive you your sin. So you have only one way. That's why Christ said to you, I have come that you might have life. And that life, you can have it in abundance. Are you tired of laboring? Day and night you work. There is nothing to show for it. Every day, you labor at the same spot. You labor for sin. You labor searching for hallows. I remember those days when I was not yet saved. 12 o'clock in the night, I'm walking with a torch. What am I looking for? I don't know. But now, I think of those days and I knew God saved me. I would have easily been beaten by a serpent or even killed. But the Lord rescued me. The same God can rescue you today. Because you might think, oh, I am enjoying my life. It's only a fool that causes sin enjoyment. No wise man ever causes sin enjoyment. But someone said, but my book and my professor in school say there is no God. It's only a fool that say there is no God. Because who are you going to believe? The professor with all his experiments that cannot turn green to white, no white or green, neither can he make one hair in your hair white or green. Is that whom you should believe? Or whose counsel you should take against God? What have you against the Lord? Oh, God allowed so so and so person to die. Are you wiser than him? Do you know his thoughts? Have you entered into his heart? Have you even deeds? Can you even know the things of the world? Not to talk of things you do not understand. Remember what he said. Hidden things belong to God. The things that are revealed, they belong to us. He revealed to you the truths that you may know them and you may save your life. Building yourselves is the key and foundational way and the only way you can build a successful self is to have 
somebody who is more experienced, like an in CGF, like an ROMT, a registered missionary trainee, trainer, who will come in to your platform to train you and make you understand a more excellent way because she also has been trained and has understood the scripture and have practiced it for years and it will be able to also teach you. You cannot understand all by yourself. Colinus was already praying. He was already saved. He was following the devotions and the fellowship with God but he still needed a teacher. So don't always say the Lord already spoke to speak to me. So the next thing I need is to build my own church. I don't need a teacher. No, you still need a teacher. You need somebody to show you a practical way of doing it. A way of fulfilling God's mandates. Understanding the God better. Whom you may not have seen or heard. Hearing it from the mouth of an apostle will give you a credence unto what God has done, what he has said, and what he has raised men up to do. We know in part, we can only prophesy in part. But when that which is complete comes, that which is in part will be done away with. So brethren, I encourage you today, participate in cell groups. Because the Bible says, I am sharpened iron. So a man sharpened the countenance of his brother. You can sharpen each other. It doesn't mind your religious. Don't say, I am not a Christian. This message is not for me. No. When Christ shall come for the church and for the saints on the last day, it's not coming for Christians. It's coming for the saints. You can be a Muslim by religions or by tradition. You can be a Buddha by tradition, but you can still be saved. You can be saved if you shall accept the Lord Jesus Christ and believe him from the heart and confess him by your mouth. You shall be saved, you and your household. Salvation has nothing to do with your religious learning. It has to do with coming to Christ and accepting his personality. Salvation, there is no salvation in any other. There is no name given under heaven by which you might be saved, other than the name Jesus Christ. The Bible says he poured his souls unto death. He, being in form of a God, does not see it as a thing of robbery to be equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation, and he became obedient even unto the point of death. Even such a shameful death on the cross. Brethren, look unto him who has endured such contradiction for sin against himself, so that he will not be weary and fenced when he is teaching. Brethren, this is where we end our today's message. God bless you as you participate. We will want to hear from you. If you have questions, please send them to our email at cgfns info at cgfnslogin.app info at cgfnslogin.app or just leave it as a comment on our page on Facebook at CGF Open House we will get back to you God bless you and you can also with the link we supplied you last week go to our website CGF Live then leave your comments on our form we will get back to you as fast as we can. God bless you as you participate. The link for which is to submit or to join the Open House Fellowship, they are below the video. You can click it anytime to participate. If you want to speak with me, just go through the website at cgfopenhousefellowship.com. My, my telephone number and all information you need to know are there. Even WhatsApp and you can connect with us and we'll have opportunity to discuss. God bless you as you participate. Let us pray. Father, we use the opportunity to exalt your name and to thank you for your brethren who have heard the word, who are interested in saving life. Father Lord, you say he that water I will be watered. Father Lord, as they have made up their mind to save life, they also, their life will be saved and will be spared on the last day. 
Father, Lord, who says there is no one that gave a cup of water to a disciple in the name that is a disciple that will by any means lost his reward. Father, Lord, I say to this one in this world that we have double, and in the world to come, they will have eternal life. Father, Lord, this I ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. For as many that are sick, I declare instant healing. As many that sit in darkness, let a great light shine upon them. As many that sat in the valley of the shadow of death, and I say, let the light of God keep shining right now. For this I ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you. As you participate.